All righty, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Can, I'm here with Linkso, and this is another one of our Wednesday talks. And uh, thank you so much for being here. We have a really special guest today, Randy Ritchie from uh, Malibu Compost. And we're gonna be doing a very, very cool talk. Uh, Randy did this for us last year around the around this time i think in november december and uh, we're doing it again this year and it's it's very relevant um to the times um so we'll get right right to the the presentation here um if you have any questions go ahead and type them into the chat and randy and myself will address them towards the end of the talk um so it might not be uh relevant at the moment that we're addressing them as you're typing it in i'll follow up and i'll i'll, I'll sort of put them aside and uh we'll make sense of all the questions towards the end and and we'll go ahead and uh, uh answer them so without further ado let's welcome randy and randy um floor is all yours all right thanks ken um hey everybody i'm glad you guys are all here today um you know welcome to uh what I think we did this class December 2nd of 2019. And it was really kind of a, uh, an interesting precursor to where we are today and what's happened and what's happening. Um, and so, you know, I have, we were all scheduled to do the class again multiple times, but we didn't get to do it. I didn't get to do it anywhere. So um, when I heard from Ken again, like, hey, you want to go online and do it? I was like, well, I'm really not like an online guy, but um, sure, why not? Let's let's try it, you know. So, um, so welcome to uh, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy plants, healthy gut. Um, I am um, one of the founders of Malibu Compost. Uh, we're out here on the west coast. I'm actually um, in Oregon, and um, hmm, I'm stuck. Let's see. There we go. Um, so here's the farm where I was at today. And um, this is in Oregon. Uh, we're below Portland, Oregon. This is one of the couple of farms that we have that we make compost on. So, um, so healthy soil. Um, one of the things I wanted to say was that when we did this class last year, um, I'm a person who, uh, you know, we're, we're organic farmers. We make organic and biodynamic compost on our farms. Uh, we do a lot of um, consulting on different farms. I grow, you know, a lot of food at home, grow a lot of food that we eat. Uh, it's really important to us. My wife is, um, she uh, does organic orchard management and compost tea applications and stuff and, and manages some really beautiful um, places down in Southern California. And so to us, you know, growing food is really, really important. And what I wanted to say to also to you guys before we start the, the, the class is, you know, we're in a really tough time right now. And uh, the world has changed a lot. And I did the class on the 2nd of December last year, I headed off to the flower and garden show up in Seattle to do the show up there. We do it every year, see all the people that we, we love up there. And we have lots of friends and, and fans up there. And, um, and as I was up there, the first cases that were you know, our admitted cases and the first deaths occurred in Kirkland, the town, uh, next town over from where I was. And on that Sunday that I left the flower and garden show, I went over um, to Whole Foods that was right nearby just to grab something, you know, um, for my car ride back down to the farm here, in, here below Portland. And it was very eerie when I got into Whole Foods, it was basically empty the shelves were pretty much bare. And that was from the time I had left um, my hotel and went to Whole Foods and, and, and got a cup of coffee to head over to the to Flower and Garden Show. And then, you know, that was 7.38 in the morning. And by the time at six o'clock in the evening, by the time I got there again and was starting to head south, it was empty. And to me, 
I hadn't really seen that before in my lifetime. And it was a very, you know, eerie and odd feeling. And so for me, that whole process of what we do in terms of growing food and looking at our health in terms of the food we grow, um, it became even more paramount. So, you know, we start with healthy soil. And here's one little last pick. That's, these are um, just so you know, like anybody doesn't know when I'm talking about windrows on our farm, these are windrows on the farm in Oregon. And as you can see on that, in the, in the slide here, the, the one that's closest to us is one that is, is newer. It has a lot more wood into it, a lot more fiber into it. The ones that as you're heading more towards the tree line there, um, especially the one in the center there is much more of a finished compost and it gets that darker color. It's much more fine in texture. And that's when I say making windrows of compost for you guys that don't know us, that's what, what we do. So soil microbes. Um, primary to everything on this earth. So, you know, um, bacteria is the building block for what we have in terms of sustaining life on, on this planet. When you guys are making compost at home, for any of you that make compost at home, and I hope that you do, when you're, when you're, or if you've been around compost piles, when you look in and you see that kind of like white powdery looking stuff that kind of filters all over um, compost that's breaking down, um, that's called actinomycetes. And that's a group of bacteria. And what that does, it, it gives you that great smell. So like when you smell the soil of earth, um, that's the smell that comes from the breakdown from the actinomycetes. Uh, the other things that you see in soil that are important, and why I'm bringing these up is I'm just going to talk about, this is not a biology class at all. Um, I'm just giving you a, a little bit of background. Then you have fungi. So you have long slender filaments and what they do is they decompose organic matter um, in nature, on a farm, in your compost pile, in your garden. Um, and they release enzymes from their hyphal tips. And then you have protozoa, they're larger organisms. They eat bacteria. And what happens is when you have bacteria and you have fungi and you have um, eating um, and decomposing little bits, micro bits, um, particulates, what happens is the larger microorganisms eat them. And then when they poop out, it, it releases the mineral, the nutrient that plants need to eat. So plants, you know, when you look out, you know, your window and you see a forest line or you see a wood line or whatever, you see a gra you know, a grassy area, there's no fertilizer there, right? It never gets fertilized. What happens is you have organic matter that falls from the trees, you have litter, you have animals that scurry along and poop and pee. And what happens is the organic matter that's in those areas gets broken down and decomposed from the smallest particulate by the bacteria and then the fungi. And then the larger microorganisms eat those poop, those nutrients that are locked in that organic matter then go up into the plants and that's called mineralization. Soil animals. The other thing that, um, and that was just a picture of a nematode. So I use nematodes all the time um, in when I'm creating uh, soil mixes. So for example, um, what I like about them is um, they will eat uh, the larva um, of, of other, what we would consider pests in our garden, right? So a lot of times when I'm making a new raised bed garden or I'm replacing soil in the raised bed garden, I will go ahead and add um, these nematodes into there. And what I'll do a lot of times is I'll add, um, uh, like Steiner nemofeltiae, I'll add a certain bunch of, mic, uh, of, of nematodes into the soil so that I can go ahead and have them go ahead and eat the larva of, um, you know, white fly, um, thrips, aphids, those types of things that we consider pests in the garden. Then you also have in your soil earthworms and burrowing insects, and they're, they're creating aeration in the soil. They create those pores and very important for our uh, healthy root structure. So that's kind of a little bit of a, of a you know, what we're, what we're trying to do when we are gardening is grow healthy soil, in my opinion. 
I don't really care about your plants. Um, I always say that I really don't care about your plants because what I know is, is if you have healthy soil and you foster healthy soil, you will have healthy plants. So as you're looking at this, as you're looking at the totality of your garden, the space you grow in, um, maybe the farm that you're buying your food from or the, the guys at the farmer's market that you get your food from, think about what kind of environment are they growing in? What, how do they care, you know, how do they treat their soil? How do they, how do they look at that? Are they, are they, you know, what, uh, is that their main goal or is their main goal just to, you know, max out, fertilize and max out and get, and get production out of their, out of their uh, growing areas. So how to create healthy soil. So on here, amend. So let, let's say you're growing in, a lot of people grow, you know, raised bed veggie gardens. Um, if you're not growing in a raised bed, um, you can be growing, you know, in the ground. I am a person who gardens and grows my soil by frequently amending. So I'm, I'm in nature when you have all that stuff dropping down, right? It ends up feeding the soil. So what I'm doing when I'm top dressing, when I'm amending, I am basically playing the role of nature in my garden that is, uh, you know, a raised bed, which is not a normal way of growing food. It's not a natural way. It's a, you know, artificial way that I've created that helps me, you know, keep my crops together. It helps me keep my watering regimen done. It, it, it utilizes the space that I have to grow in. So I gave you a couple tips, you know, um, on, on amending. What I do is I do, I frequently um, use a little bit, little, and I mean little bits, a 16th of an inch of kelp, alfalfa, a mined basalt, which is called rock dust. You can call it, a lot of people call it rock dust and worm castings. Um, I'm really careful about where I get the worm castings from because a lot of commercial worm castings um, uh, come from just big areas where they feed, um, they feed cardboard and there's, and there's the chemicals in the adhesive there. I'm just real careful about what I use. I use a really clean, um, uh, worm casting. And when you're using, and, and what I do also is I, I research stuff guys. So like when I'm looking for stuff, what I showed you here is these kelp meal and um, the alfalfa meal and the cascade minerals. Um, the kelp meal and the alfalfa meal are from down to earth. They're OMRI listed. And also I know um, these guys, this company uh, personally, because I, I work with them all the time, but I know they have certain products that are completely clean, GMO free, true organic. And that's what I'm looking for. So as you're looking to build a garden, keep thinking that way. Compost, that's another, that's, um, that's our California uh, location. Um, when I say compost, and I hope you do compost at home, um, for me, composting at home is a great thing because what it does is you get to control your inputs. You get to control what happens in terms of whether are any chemicals or synthetics get into your compost, which is one of the things we get to do on our farm. So I'm taking here, what you're looking at is dairy, organic dairy cow manure, wood chips that we bring in to put into the loafing sheds where the cows are when it's either rainy or cold, um, in the summertime when it's super hot, they will be in pasture at night and inside during the day. So we put wood chips down in what's called the big barns that are loafing sheds. And what those guys do is they go in and rest there um, and we clean out um, the loafing sheds and we use that. Um, and we use what's in a flush pond or in a separator, coming off of a separator in terms of uh, our inputs. So you want to compost everything all the time. I compost heavily in the spring and in the fall. And then I also um, compost, you know, between a 16th of an inch and a quarter of an inch frequently. I just literally take compost and I hope you can see my hands. And I get it in my hand and I'm just walking out with a bag and I'm just throwing it on there, just really light. Like I'm just dropping compost on there. And what I do then is I water it in. These are the two main ways that I fertilize because I don't use fertilizer. 
and on any of our farms and on any of the orchard projects, any of the food projects that we work on, we don't use fertilizers. So I just gave you how I fertilize, how you create, how we create healthy soil. Um, one of the important things I wrote on, uh, I, I have here is I, I don't want you guys, um, oops. Um, and one last thing on the compost, I'll go back on this. You've got in a finished compost, if you look on the screen here, you'll see all of these different um, elements that are in here that are in a good finished compost. And, those, and it's important because all of those things play a role in terms of what plants need and in terms of ultimately what humans need. One of the things uh, in terms of um, amending that is really important is don't ever use bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, or cottonseed meal. I don't use them. Um, and if you wanna know why I don't use them, um, basically um, is all of those things um, come from Roundup Ready crops. And Roundup Ready crops are crops that are sprayed uh, with herbicide. So, uh, and what happens is they've been genetically modified so that they don't die. The weeds around them will die, um, but they don't die. So I don't use them because of that. And one of the things that how we got to there is when we first started making compost um, uh, for us to sell, we were testing our compost and we were running um, genetic IDs. We were, we were checking to make sure that in the feedstocks that our cows eat, that there were no genetically modified organisms. So we were looking for, um, you know, we were looking for Roundup Ready uh, uh, alfalfa. We were looking for Roundup Ready corn. We were looking for things that could be sprayed. As we get into, and I don't want to go off on this tangent, but as we get into uh, looking at GMO foods um, further, uh, I think it's interesting to look at how you create GMO foods and now how we look at and that's using and that's using RNA. And now in the situation that we find ourselves in today, we have vaccines coming out that they're using the same type of technology. They're using RNA um, in their genetic modification technique. And so you can look uh, you can research this, you know, quite a bit. In fact, uh, one of the areas that I found a very interesting paper on this uh, was on the uh, Public Health Authority in Australia. So the PHAA uh, have a very interesting piece on RNA, what it does, and genetically modified foods and how that works. So you might want to take a look at that because what happens is is um, the RNA molecules rather than proteins um, are used to drive the genes, uh, the change um, uh, to spread an altered DNA. And what happens with that is um, you can very rapidly change a population um, by developing a synthetic uh, biology, form of biology. So it's an interesting, place that we're in today. I, I didn't really think about that until what's happened recently. Um, on the testing too, like one of the things that's really interesting when you start to test soils and compost, uh, you can see here, just a, it's, a, it's a quick uh, analysis that gives you a base soil analysis. It basically tells you what your nitrogen level, um, your phosphorus, your potassium gives you basically elemental and you know, metal levels. Um, it tells you what your pH is. It tells you what your um, uh, salt level is, carbon and nitrogen, nitrogen ratio. These are really good. The other thing too, you'll notice, we're looking for pathogens to make sure there's no pathogens in there. And another thing that you'll see on here, physical contaminants. A lot of compost that people buy, um, you know, have contaminants in them. So depending on where you're sourcing your stuff. So what I always say is find a clean, you know, true organic, uh, non-GMO compost, you know, uh, 
make compost at home, create an environment where you are creating healthy soil and healthy and healthy environment that you can compost your material from. So, you know, you'll find things like um, even in, uh, you know, local compost up here in Portland, you'll find, you know, needles, you'll find plastic, you find glass, you know, you find all kinds of stuff, you find metal, which is called sharps, you know, you'll find all kinds of stuff in them. So just be careful with what you're putting into your soil. Mulching. Um, you know, mulching is a great thing to do to help with the soil uh, health in your garden. Uh, I do it all the time just because I'm in an environment where we get, uh, our environment can be either very dry cold or very dry hot. So I use it as a way to keep moisture um, for the biology, for the microbes in the soil. I use the mulching that way. Um, so, you know, I save my leaves all the time. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, put them out in the, uh, the recycling bin for the, you know, for pickup by the, by the uh, city. Uh, and that's another thing too, you know, when you're getting compost, by the way, from, you know, from a, from an urban spot, remember they're picking up recycling bins and those recycling bins are taking from the entire pool of an area. And so if you have neighbors that spray Roundup or spray pesticides or spray whatever, and they and what do they always do? They always spray it, it dies, they throw it into the green bin and boom, there it goes off to the landfill, it gets separated and it goes into what they call, you know, city compost. So I personally don't use it. Um, I'm, I'm not interested in it because uh, they don't have a way to segregate it to the place where I believe that it's safe. Oops, we're going backwards here. <laughs> Why is my thing going so crazy, Ken? Um, are you clicking the space bar or just the arrows? It's gone, it's gone like here. I'm gonna have to go back and just like click this back up so I can get on here. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what's uh, happened here, but uh -oh. we will. Okay. So compost tea. Um, I don't know if uh, many of you have used compost tea. It's one of my favorite things to use. Uh, it's something that feeds your plants and feeds the soil at the same time. Uh, I do it all the time as a soil drench. And um, I do that, you know, um, in some of my, in some of my garden, like in my food garden, my rose garden, areas like that, heavy feeders, I compost tea every every 30 days. So um, I'm composting uh, composting all the time. Uh, a, a drench for me is what's equal to a normal watering. So what I've done here, this you're looking at a five gallon bucket and um, I've got a little tea bag in there um, that has compost tea in it and basically you let it soak overnight. It does what's called an extraction. You don't have to do an aeration. And what that does is uh, it creates a very nice, very potent um, compost tea and elixir that you know basically you can go ahead and drench your plants with. They love it. Uh, it works really well on powdery mildew. It works great on rust and so a couple other fungal issues. You can use it also to spray diseased leaves. It works fantastic to do that as well. Um, this is something else that I've got on here, um, which is a microbial inoculant and it's, it's called EM1. And I like this product a lot. What I do is probably about every 90 days or so when I make a compost tea, I also add EM1 into it and it's a lactic acid uh, bacteria um, and it's a uh, phototrophic bacteria element. And so what you do is it aids in composting, it aids in breaking down organic matter. Um, it's really good um, for uh, uh, as a biological control for fungal diseases. It's great as a drench and I use it all the time mixed with my compost tea. Um, they sell this around the globe. So you can always find EM1 in America. Uh, it's offered by a company called Terraganix and that's T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X. Uh, really good, really good company. Okay, um, planting in the ground. Um, I'm really big on utilizing my native soil. So anytime I 
dig a hole. Uh, we just moved to a new spot and I just planted an orchard uh, this last week before I came up to Oregon to the farm. And what I did is I, I, I dug all my holes. I staked everywhere I was gonna plant and then I dug all my holes. What I did is I saved all of that soil. I put my soil on big um, tarps or big compost covers um, and that I lay out, um, out uh, along this road that goes up to the back of our place. And um, I, I took all of the soil, I took out some of the big, big chunky rocks. I'm, I'm in clay and rock. And, and so I, have, I, I had a lot of big, big rock in my holes. Um, and then what I do is I mix my soil. I do half, um, I do one third compost, one third native soil. And then I take, like we make a potting soil, baby boost potting soil. I take one third of that as well, because what I'm doing is I'm, I'm putting trees, all of the trees I put in were, mostly 15 gallons and a few of them were five gallons and what i'm doing is by adding the potting soil to the mix i'm giving some of the other natural fertilizers like um like fish bone meal uh kelp meal um and i'm also giving them a little bit more room for those roots to start to spread out so it's not such a dense mix and i call it the million dollar mix just because uh, I've used it on so many different projects that we've done landscape projects, farming projects. So when I'm planting in ground, uh, and if you want to mix your own mix up, use your native, use a good compost, you know, use your own compost if you make a good compost, and then you know get uh, get a bale of of uh, use some core, or you know if you if you use peat, um, I don't really have peat in my mixes, but if you do, you can use that. But you can use core, you can use um, uh, um, you know some volcanic rock for some aeration. Put a little bit of that, you know. Put some um, add some stuff in there like kelp you know, maybe a little bit of fish bone meal, a little bit of worm castings, you can create your own million dollar mix and, and have great results as well. So healthy food. So starting off with healthy soil, I think is what's going to lead us to grow healthy food. And hopefully everybody that's on here is either growing food or they're thinking about growing food because with the way the world is today, um, I think it's more important than ever to find a way to either grow healthy food or source healthy food. And we'll talk about what that is in just a second, um, because we're in a place right now where supply chains, you know, sometimes are not so great. I, I, am, I am a farmer. So I see what's happening in the farming areas around me. It's been really tough for a lot of the packing plants because they've had people, you know, if you get one or two people that get COVID, then they've got to pull everybody out of the packing house, people quarantine. Um, it's our, I would say as an organic farmer today, and I say true organic because I don't use anything that's not real organic. I sh just showed you what I use and it's all really basic. Um, I think that it's getting harder to get food. And I think that our food safety and security is, uh, is, is tighter and tougher than it's ever been. So I don't say that to scare people. I say that to be prepared, grow food, know the farmers at your farmer's market, ask questions. You know, I'm that annoying guy that asks a million questions at my farmer's market, just because I want to know like, hey, if I'm going to buy stuff from you guys, you know, what's in it? How'd you grow it? You know. Um, How's your water supply? What do you, you know, just, you know, just find out what's up. So healthy foods. So unfortunately, um, for a lot of people, they have no idea. And if you don't know, this isn't healthy food. Okay. So it's, um, but for a lot of people, we live in a fast food world. We live in this place where, you know, everything has to be, you know, instantaneous, you know, um, what we just talked about growing healthy soil, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time. So if you live in a place that had pesticides or herbicides or fungicides there, you don't know what the previous owner of your place used. Um, it takes time, but the beauty of it is that the biology, the microbes, nature will go ahead and um, decompose and, and and through the pot process of watering and flushing and stuff breaking down, eventually 
toxins get broken down by the biology, which is another great reason to make sure that we foster the biology in our garden. So that kind of meal, I'm sure that no one on this uh, Zoom class has ever had a meal like that. Um, organic food. So, you know, here's another thing too. So what is organic food? You know, you look at this stuff and you see, you know, you go in your stores and everybody carries organic food now, um, you know, and it's according to, you know, um, in America, according to the USDA organic and the AMS, the Agricultural Marketing Service, it's supposed to be grown without pesticides, grown without chemicals, grown without synthetics. Except as you look, dig further into the organic registration in the United States, which is uh, the National Organic Program, what you start to see is, oh, they have these other lists though on there. And if you really want to like, you know, dig into it, go ahead, look at the, go on to the National Organic Program uh, of the USDA and look at what, um, you know, what constitutes organic food and organic growing. I think it's a great eye opener for people because a lot of stuff that you can use in growing organically, um, a lot of times we wouldn't necessarily think that. Um, so for me, um, this is the guys, the agricultural marketing services, they run the um, National Organic Program, which is also an interesting thing. If you think about that, like why does the AMS of the USDA run the organic program? And basically because as they started this program, um, this is, you know, we now run organics primarily for uh, a big part of the world. A lot of, uh, a lot of different countries um, in different parts of the world have USDA certifications that are certifiers that work with us and uh, meaning the USDA, not us meaning me. I'm, I have to, I have to, because I make organic products, I'm beholden to these guys, but I always believe um, in an old adage that we put on the back of our bags, which is go beyond organic. So for me, I'm always looking, how do I go beyond what these guys, what the regulators want me to, to have? Because what they're looking to have is a, a, is a bare minimum. And when we created the organic program here, they were trying to find a way to put organic and conventional farmers together. And it kind of just became a big, mishmash of stuff so it's it's some of the stuff about it uh is good some of the stuff not so good um uh, but i can tell you one thing there's been a lot of money made off of organic uh in the last you know um in the last 20 years so uh that's something to keep you know keep a note of which is another reason that i that i grow food uh at home so organic food you know it should come from uh, soil that had clean organic matter, that was rich in biological diversity. The food that, that you have should have been grown in stuff that has safe metal levels. Very important to think about where is your food coming from? Who is growing your food? Is it part of a big ag concern? Whether it's organic or not, or is it coming from a small local farm? Is it coming from your yard? Is it coming from your community garden? Is it coming from a small urban farm that you can buy from um, or that you share, you know, uh, with? Sourcing is important, you know, um, for me, you know, grow at home, organic from the local farmer's market. And a lot of people, um, you know, just think because it's at a farmer's market, it's organic. Ask the people, you know, find out what's happening. Um, if you go to one of the larger stores like Sprouts or Whole Foods or New Seasons or whatever, ask the people, um, is this coming from local organic or biodynamic farms? Where is it coming from? Uh, that's, you know, we've all heard know your farmer, know your farmer, because knowing your farmer, the reason that we're all on this um, Zoom cast together is because we're either curious about or we're concerned with what kind of food are we getting into our gut? How is our gut health playing with the rest of our health? And so that is um, 
you know, these are important questions to ask because we're thinking about those things. Um, if we weren't, we would be on, you know, something like, you know, how do I, you know, uh, you know, decorate the best, you know, 50 Christmas decorations? How do I create those? You know, we're worried today about this or we're thinking about this, which is great. And by the way, I'm really glad, you know, we've got several people on here. I'm really glad that we're on here because I think us thinking about this and us talking about this is very important. So healthy plants. Um, it's interesting as you look at, you know, you think about stuff, you know, we see all these great commercials everywhere, right? That have all these amazing, um, you know, healthy, you know, looking, you know, pieces of produce and, you know, plants that are on, you know, ads and you see all these different big companies that are like, you know, showing you all this great stuff you can grow with their, you know, instant, you know, whammo bammo, put some water in there and throw it out there and you too will have a green thumb and, you know, grow the greatest thing ever. Um, and they, and I've noticed them marketing a lot more to, um, you know, to, uh, the urban market because the, you know, because, Homes are shrinking, stuff's shrinking, um, and there's a lot of people at home, and they're trying to grab your business. So, um, healthy plants, you know, basically, uh, if you want to grow healthy plants, the stuff that I gave you on the first part of this about healthy soil, that's your key. That's 100% your key. What you're looking at here with these microgreens, those are microgreens that are grown, uh, a huge microgreen grower that we work with that works with Whole Foods um, down in Southern California. Uh, we supply them with soil mixes and these guys get a, uh, so they're, you know, you're looking at mass production here, but you're also looking at really, really healthy greens. Uh, I do a lot of, um, I personally have a lot of roses because I love them and I treat my roses the same way that I treat my food. I don't change how I garden um, or how I grow or how I care for the soil because, oh, this is my food area and this is my other area. The entire area that I garden in or that I grow in is a growing space, is an ecological space for me and for my family. And my whole goal is to foster the microbes there. That's the whole goal there. And if I have that and I'm growing cleanly, then I'm creating a clean space. And I have so much um, uh, wildlife that comes into our garden. And it's amazing to see. And when you just sit there, you know, in the morning and look out and see everything that's kind of going out there, it's, it's, it's very much alive, you know. And so create the healthiest space that you can. Sources, you know, like seeds starts out like that. Where are you going to get your seeds from? Um, I hope some of you guys out there um, save seed. We do all the time. If we grow something and it grows incredibly well, then we will um, we'll let it grow out. We'll let it flower out and we'll, we'll save the seeds from those. Uh, and that's a great way. We have, we have uh, at our house, uh, wow. We have, um, we have a lot of seeds that we've saved and we keep growing stuff that we like so we can keep saving seeds so seed stays fresh. Um, the other thing you can do is I always look for good when I'm looking you know, outside um, of what we've grown. I look for really good heirloom seeds. Uh, I look for, you know, I just bought a bunch of stuff from um, uh, high mowing and they have great seeds for um, cover crops. Um, and then organic and biodynamic seeds. There's a couple of really good companies out there. Uh, I like turtle tree seeds a lot. I bought a lot of their stuff. They have a lot of heirloom varieties and I've grown a ton of stuff uh, that, they, that we've bought from them and very successfully, you know, so um, they have good, you know, they have good seed stock. Um, starts, a lot of times when we're growing gardens and, you know, and we're looking to get stuff going right away, especially if we have any kind of, you know, food fear or food insecurity, we're looking for, let's get some starts. Well, that's an important thing. Um, and that's great to do that, but it's like, where are they coming from? Who's supplying those? Because a lot of these starts at most of your nurseries, especially the big box stores, are really huge growing yards. And what they're growing and the stuff where they're starting the seeds in is not even 
a real soil mix today. If you, you know, it's, it, it's basically a, a lot of just, um, waste that people use to start your seeds. It's very airy, very light. There's not a lot of good organic matter in there. And so, um, it's, you know, I'm always amazed. So I'm always amazed to see starts that have been grown that way and to see like how many of them are surviving at a Home Depot or, a, you know, some big box store, that kind of a place. It's so here, and here's the other thing. If that's the only place you can get starts, it's okay. You can transition. You can go ahead and transition um, those starts by putting them into uh, a healthy soil and growing them that way, um, you know, and then feeding them with tea, feeding them um, with EM1, you know, top dressing with compost frequently, making sure that you have, um, you know, throughout the growing season, uh, a couple of times you at least compost tea your food crops. And I, you know, generally through the middle of my uh, growing cycle, I'll go ahead and amend um, you know, with the things that I talked about earlier, just at a 16th of an inch and throw a little bit of compost on there. And I keep amending and keep breaking down. I keep doing that with frequency. Um, it's, it's what I care much more about in my garden and in my grows than I care about anything else. Um, so where to start, you know, so maintenance, you know, protocols. So um, what you're seeing up in the corner here is a big compost tea brewer. I've got several different types of brewers, um, you know, different products for lawn. You know, if you have lawn, I'm not opposed to lawn. We have a little bit of lawn. We have, uh, we have dogs, um, you know, but so what I do is I grow my lawn organically and I grow my little bit of lawn in a way that it becomes the best worm field ever in history because I just use compost and compost tea, or I use this product like this, Blue's Blades, which basically, has a lot of the same stuff that a potting soil has in it, um, but it doesn't have um, the wood, it doesn't have um, the core, it doesn't have that type of thing, and it doesn't have any aeration in it. It's much more of a dense, it's about 98% compost, and the rest, some fertilizers, which really help with the lawn and also help um, um, stimulate the biology in the lawn. And then what you're seeing here up in that left corner there is just, you know, top dressing, just, you're just top dressing, you know, over a raised bed. And I just do that all the time and I'm watering all the time. And, and that is a, you know, it's a really easy way to continue to grow your soil and to continue to grow healthy plants. Um, look at, you know, uh, you don't need fertilizers. You don't need synthetics. You don't need chemicals. You don't need pesticides. You don't need herbicides. You can just, um, you know, you can grow in a natural way that doesn't include uh, incorporating um, an exterior uh, form of agriculture or of growing, which is what we've been told for so long. We've been told how to grow in a way that is so um, much the opposite of what happens in a garden if we just let it be and if we take the time to let it grow. Um, I was talking to some people today that, that uh, are working on a 26 acre, yeah, 26 acre urban farm um, that we went on and transitioned from uh, an urban farm that has a huge orchard on it and uh, a big food grow. And it also, because it happens to be down in Southern California, it has um, a lot of, uh, has a bamboo forest. It has an amazing uh, mix of plants. When we went in there, we basically just um, flushed that place with compost tea and um, we started composting, we started doing exactly what I told you. And this is about 10 years ago. And um, somebody was down there today that works with us that hadn't been there in a while and just said to me on the phone, you will not believe how this place looks. And I said, yeah, it's pretty amazing, right? And I haven't seen it in, in a couple of years now, but it looked amazing last time I was there, but I, I don't have time to go there anymore. Um, and basically for 10 years, that site has had nothing on it that was a chemical or a synthetic. It's only had compost. It's had some of those amendments that we talked about and a lot of compost tea. 
We also added the beneficial insects, um, you know, in there uh, in terms of, you know, that's our pest, you know, in terms of pest management. And we use, um, uh, we use compost tea all the time there. And that helps as well on fungal disease. But we're talking 26 acres and it's, and it is pristine and it's amazing. So back when I was showing you the, um, uh, the lab results on the compost. It showed you a bunch of these different things in the lab results, right? So compost has that in it, soil has that in it. So I put on here just, you know, some things for like what, you know, plants need to grow. And you have, you know, your basics, you know, nitrogen, your key element. Um, and I've got in here, it kind of talks about what each of these things do for the plants. And there are, you know, they're all really important. And the reason that I've got them on here is because ironically, as we get to the next phase, as we get into how this affects humans, we need a lot of these things. We need a lot of these things for our health. And where are we getting them from? So if you look at this, you know, um, you know, I'll just pick one out, um, you know, magnesium a key component of chlorophyll, the green material um, of plants, you know, it, it's, it's vital um, for photosynthesis. Um, uh, you know, magnesium is also vital for humans. So take a look at this as you guys have a chance to, um, if you get, if you download the, um, uh, if, if you want to have the, uh, the PowerPoint shared with you, because these are all really good things just to kind of know as a background. So as you're looking at compost and you're looking at where am I sourcing my compost, have these guys done any lab analysis on it? You know, um, A, are they making it in a healthy, clean, safe way? You know, B, um, am I getting the nutrients that my plants need to grow in it? And that's, a, you know, you need to know that. If you're also making compost at home, you can also always send your compost to offer a lab analysis, which I highly recommend. We, we do it too uh, at, at our home. So we make compost uh, at home and I send it off a couple times a year for an analysis that gives me a basic soil analysis. Let me cut it now. <laughs> Let me cut it now. Healthy humans. Oh. One thing I did want to say too is I, you know, um, before we move on to this this piece, we um, we are a, a biodynamic compost company too, and I don't know how many of you, depending on where you are, you know, know biodynamics, and um, hopefully several of you do. Again, if you don't know, um, look it up. It's an interesting form of agriculture. Uh, we use um, preparations um, uh, that are botanical preparations um, in our compost and making the compost. And they all have a different relationship, um, you know, to the earth um, and to the soil and, uh, and to the microbes in the soil. So uh, if you look up biodynamics, if you look up, uh, you'll find Rudolf Steiner. Uh, if you look, you'll see him, um, look him up. Uh, but you look up the biodynamic preparations and they're, and they're very interesting. Um, you know, things like even like, like in them, you'll see uh, there's uh, yarrow, chamomile, um, stinging nettle, white oak bark, uh, dandelion, valerian. We have those um, preparations. We make our compost with those preparations and they all do some very interesting things. So I would uh, implore you guys to take a look and, and see uh, what you think. All right, healthy humans. So what do we need to be healthy? So if you look here, you know, the 16 essential minerals that we have here, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, magnesium. If you look at all of those things, um, we need them in our bodies. And how do we get them? We get them from the food that we eat. Uh, you know, sometimes people take nutrients if they have, uh, you know, um, deficiencies in some of these things. Um, I know that uh, my natural path is uh, constantly giving me um, 
some extra pills that for, for calcium, you know, from, uh, that she, that she highly recommends. So I'm using that. Um, and maybe that just happens to be because I'm getting older and who knows, maybe she's worried about me falling off the tractor and breaking my, uh, breaking my leg. Um, so what do we need those minerals for? What they do in our body, if we don't have them, they maintain blood pressure. They are, um, they give us uh, fluid and electrolyte balance. They're important for our bone health. They make new cells. Um, they deliver oxygen to cells. They contribute to normal muscle and nerve functioning. And these are all really, really, um, you know, critical. Same, same thing that happens with plants. These minerals absolutely create healthy plants. And the same minerals that create those healthy plants create healthy people. You know, we have 100 trillion cells um, in an adult human being and less than 10% of them. Are, are human. So everything else is um, uh, bacteria, yeast, fungi, and other microbes. So we're, we're, we're more microbe than we are human cell. How do we get the minerals? Through healthy food. We're going to grow healthy food, right? That's how we're going to go ahead and get it. Um, we're going to grow our microbiome. You are the microbiome. So our bodies are a microbiome. And the NIH, who we've seen all the time, you know, uh, you know, through this, this coronavirus uh, outbreak, through the COVID outbreak, they've done a, a several studies now on the microbiome. And it's really important because what we are is we're just one giant, big, super organism. And, um, and our bodies perform, you know, with the use of the biology, uh, they provide all kinds of critical functions. And as I just said a second ago, you know, we've got, you know, microbes way outnumber our own, our own human cells, you know? And if you look at, um, I think this is an interesting thing. If you look at how many, um, the makeup of the microbes in our body, you know, weighs about three pounds and it's the same as the weight of our brain. And a couple of things that are interesting about that is they're doing studies uh, now on how um, soil biology helps um, the brain. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So our gut. So we're eating food. We're bringing food into, because we need these minerals, we're bringing food into our microbiome, which is us. So we're this, you know, we're this, this complex network that's breaking everything down that comes into us and is getting dispersed for overall health in the body. And the main controller of that is our gut, because we're bringing the food, we're bringing the way that we extract um, the minerals and the nutrients into our gut. Healthy gut, a um, lot of recent studies, a lot of studies on, um, on the gut health and, and, uh, and soil biology. That's another area where I would, you know, it's what made me start thinking about this. I started thinking about, I was, I was looking at something, I read an article about how they're looking at food allergies right now. And they've been doing studies in Canada and studies here in the US um, to try to find out why kids um, are having so many food allergies right now. And so what happened was um, they started to look to see um, if, if these children that they were, uh, were part of their study, if they had, um, if they had soil biology uh, in uh, different samples that they took from the kids. And they were looking to find out um, uh, were the kids that were healthy did they have soil biology? Did they have bacterial microbes in them that were from the soil? Um, and the kids that were not healthy, did they have those microbes or not? A lot of, lot of studies have shown that um, 
because of where we are environmentally, how families live today, how um, we have less space, children are uh, in the soil a lot less. Um, and maybe that's going to change because people, you know, right now, for sure, being at home, you know, kids are gardening and, and families are gardening. And I've seen more people garden at home more than ever um, this year. And I hope that keeps going. So maybe, you know, kids will get back into the soil because for me, that's actually how I, that's how I learned, um, you know, how to garden. I started gardening with my grandmother and um, back in New Jersey when I was a little kid and I, I loved it. And so every summer I looked forward to going back to um, their place and getting to garden with her and you know, grow her tomatoes and grow, and grow all of these um, things that for me um, allowed me to see where food came from and how actually real food tastes and, um, and kind of start learning how to eat what I was craving too. And I, I guess some of the biology that I was craving, I was eating that stuff. Um, there have been other really interesting uh, lab studies on um, soil microbes and human health. Uh, there was one study that happened in, um, that was done in the UK um, on people, uh, a lady by the name of Dr. Mary O'Brien did a study um, on, uh, she's an oncologist, she did a study on people who had lung cancer. And what she was trying to um, find out um, was if uh, uh, Mycobacterium basse would, would um, uh, help um, people in terms of, of how living a longer life if they were injected with this soil uh, bacterium. And what happened was she didn't see, she didn't prove that they lived longer but what she did prove um, in her in her test was that um, the people that were injected that had lung cancer, and this is this is late term lung cancer, um, they were happy. They became more vital. They had um, uh, better cognitive function, and overall, how they felt. Um, uh, during the late stages of their cancer was much better than the other um, patients that she had that were not in the study. And that's something that's, that's, that's happened a lot um, where uh, um, they're looking at, they're looking at right now how soil bacterium uh, can affect depression and how it can affect PTSD. So they're doing several studies right now on those uh, two things. And we live in a, in, a, in a time right now where versus where we were at in the 1990s versus today, we, we have 25% um, of our population is um, using um, some sort of mood elevator um, because of uh, depression. And one of the things that they're looking at is how can introducing soil bacterium or changes in diet, which, which would introduce the soil bacterium, how does that affect the mental state of the patients who are in the studies? And they're having some really, really uh, great results with that. So that's something you know in the future that I hope medicine goes that way uh, instead of you know going into you know, give us more drugs. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and there's, a, there's several reasons that, you know, we have depression. So, um, but if we can learn how to medically treat some of that uh, and some of the people that are affected with depression by using soil biology, I think that would be, you know, phenomenal. Um, all right, let me move down here. So, how do we get, um, you know, how do we get the biology in our bodies? We eat the food, right? So we have an environmental piece to this. We also have a genetic piece of this. And then here we are. Here, here, here is us, little human microbiome. Um, and we're just starting to understand 
you know, studies on the gut, like we're, we're at baby steps, baby level on that. So this is not something that is, um, you know, in a world today where it's, you know, uh, you know, show me the science, the science is developing. A lot of, I think what I do in terms of whether it's growing soil or growing food or, um, you know, looking at disease and if, if there's any diseases in my plants, um, uh, I look at really simple ways to address what's the simplest way what is um what's the most natural way that i can address an issue and what is a way that that i can i i can use my common sense i can know that hey if i have a um an aphid outbreak I don't need to ruin years of, of true organic gardening by running out and getting a pesticide. I know that I can go ahead and introduce lace wings and introduce ladybugs into the garden, which is a simple example. Um, and if I do that with frequency, uh, as I have tender growth in the garden, uh, which is what they're attracted to, then I will ultimately wipe out that population without introducing any chemicals. So I think what, what's happening now in terms of gut health, we're starting to see the same kind of thing where you're seeing practical application of in these studies of you know, having people you know, ingest um, the bacterium and to see what kind of results we're getting and take hunches like, huh, Okay, so like the thing with the, with the depression, the thing with the um, uh, food allergies, the same thing with allergies. Uh, you know, if these things, and that makes sense because uh, that would be a gut related, you know, thing. So um, what happens also, so that you know, like when you're eating food. So like, let's say we're eating, um, let's say we're eating a salad, right? So we've got a lot of um, uh, soft uh, tissue, uh, vegetable that we're ingesting in our body. What happens um, in plants is, as we discussed earlier in the first part of this, as the, as the biology breaks down the nutrient and it uptakes into the plant, that plant, so let's say you're going to eat your salad that you just took out of the garden, right? Well, if you've grown in a way that it's completely healthy and clean and safe, then what you're getting is basically just nutrient. That you, that's what you're getting, nutrient mineral that you're getting into that, into that salad. If you fed a fertilizer or if you have um, sprayed with a pesticide or if you sprayed an herbicide out there, what happens is you get those particulates um, into, um, into the soil, um, you get them into, uh, and into uptake into that plant and they're absorbed into that leafy green, which is why I'm saying, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't use bone meal, blood meal, uh, feather meal, cottonseed meal. Um, and so what happens is you can take up bad stuff, but on the same token, if you're growing completely cleanly and completely safely, you can take up what's called hitchhikers, you can take up, you know, um, you can take up bacterium into that tissue of the of the plant that you're eating. And that gets into your gut. Um, so that's, you know, and that and that gets into us from ingested food. There's been studies where depending on where your water comes from and how treated your water is, you get different bacterium that comes through water that can come through um, shower heads, come through the faucet. Uh, that happens as well. So um, that's also an, uh, a really important um, you know, thing. The other thing too is also um, we can get through each other, through, you know, skin oils, through things like that. So contact with other humans, um, we get, uh, we get um, bacteria, we get other things that way uh, through, through that as well. Um, the microbes in your gut, really important in terms of um, building your immune system, in terms of fermenting um, indigestible uh, things that we bring into our bodies. And I think we bring in a lot of, um, you know, faux food uh, in our body these bodies these days, and uh, the gut microbiota breaks all of that down. Uh, it also breaks down, as it does in the soil, um, environmental pollutants, pharmaceuticals, um, and 
that's super important. One of the things that they've, they've, they've realized in all the studies on the, on, the, uh, on the gut health right now is that um, dysbiosis, which um, uh, is where you get a disruption in a healthy uh, level of uh, bacteria um, and biology in your gut, um, they're seeing it leads to uh, gastrointestinal issues, cardiovascular issues, autoimmune. Um, you know, so uh, getting as much clean, healthy food that comes from the soil, that's grown in soil, is going to help you get as much of the biology in your gut that you that you have and that you need. Um, environmental issues. So that's actually a nice compost pile starting right there. Not really, just kidding. Um, our environmental issues uh, influences on gut microbiota. Um, it's important because our living environment from when we were, you know, first man on this planet has changed a lot from how we eat to how we acquire our food to where our food comes from. And, uh, you know, we are, we have become a population that's very urbanized and people are either in the city or they're in the suburbs. And you have a lot of uh, situation where you have almost no room to grow in some of those areas. You have uh, places where, you know, there aren't any farms close by, you know, that's why we have farmers markets where people are coming from, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles away to bring food to a more urban uh, population. Uh, the other thing um, uh, is when we don't have soil to touch and be in and get on our skin and get in our body, um, <clears throat> We have, um, we reduce the level of microbiota that we have and it creates inflammatory disease. And these diseases, a lot of inflammation, they're looking at today, there are connections uh, between um, uh, depression and inflammation. The phytobiome. <clears throat> so this is where at the root level stuff happens in terms of what's going up into your body. Um, so how this basically works, works is I've given you just kind of like a little, a little map here of um, what happens at the, at the root level. And that's what's going to be important getting up into your body. So we, um, you know, plants secrete compounds that feed the microbes. The microbes uh, go ahead and, and then that allow the plants to uh, get nutrient and bring nutrient up to them. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to grab a sip of water here because I'm, I've never talked this much in a row. <clears throat> so what I put on here, so your phyto not <clears throat> your phytonutrients and antioxidants um, um, that are manufactured by the plants, these are what give every, you know, they, A, protect plants from um, diseases and from pests, but they also give chemicals. Uh, the chemicals give these fruits, their distinct taste and vegetables, their distinct taste, their distinct flavor, their smell. And these same chemicals that are in the food that are in your, that are coming from the soil in your food, they also stimulate our immune system, stimulate our hormone system. Um, you know, um, they slow down the growth of, of human cancer cells and all these things have been studied. And so as I'm taking it back on a really simple level, it all starts with healthy soil and it all starts with eating and ingesting healthy food. Remember your yard, you know, I was saying about how at my yard, you know, I, I'm, I'm always blown away at how much life that I have in there. And it's really important because some of the, um, <clears throat> some of the biology um, that is in the soil, you know, comes from like, even from um, uh, bird feathers, you know, there's, 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 um, you know, there's bacterium that come from, 
uh, sparrows and small birds that you know are more on the ground and they get into the soil and they break down in the soil and they're you know they are in the soil and they all have beneficial um, th each microbe has a has a benefit to the soil and a lot of those things have a benefit to us as we take them up into our bodies uh, this is um, kind of the biggest when I said the 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 doctor was injecting um, her patients uh, with a soil bacterium. This is what she was using. And um, she was looking at this to see if, 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 if injecting the biology into uh, a patient, you know, if it, if it does all the things that we know that it does, which is um, influences uh, our smells and our mood, she was hoping that it would help also longevity is what she was looking for. But there have been uh, a, in the last, uh, last, I don't know, five to 10 years, multiple studies that show how soil biology um, uh, affects our immune system and influences our immune system. And that's probably to me, uh, more critical than ever today is that we look at ways to create a healthy immune system. Um, for me, you know, that includes just, you know, um, exercise, eating right, sleeping, um, getting rest, you know, uh, having some sort of center through meditation and prayer, all of those things. Um, you know, the back, this bacteria, the mycobacterium vesse grows in, um, uh, soil. And uh, on, for example, like a, like I was talking about leafy vegetables, like a leafy spinach, you can get 800 species of bacteria just inside the leaf structure of a, of one spinach. Uh, we can have a direct impact on our guts by what we grow and by how we grow. Uh, I, you know, for me, a lot of this just made sense from what happened with me over time as I transitioned from uh, a traditional landscaper and farmer into an organic farmer, into a true organic farmer. And what I started to see in terms of the food we were growing, the soil health, uh, the property health, um, the types of crops that we were getting and uh and overall just that 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 sense of um how it feels when you actually eat real food and when you actually take the time to not just gobble down a bunch of stuff in your car leaving a fast food restaurant but even that process of harvesting your food cleaning your food that you've grown and going ahead and preparing your food all of those things that we've done for centuries you know we we as modern man have have you know we tend to push that away and 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 you know i believe that that there's a connection between all of this and this is you know this is my theory this is my thought you know um i think that if you are interested you know um follow the studies you know check them out on your own just don't take my word for it grow food grow healthy soil, grow healthy plants. And I believe that you will grow a healthier you. You'll have a healthier gut and you'll have a healthier life. And um, with that, I say thank you. And if you're, if, if you're interested in Malibu compost, you know, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. You can check out our blogs and we do gardening tips also at www.malibucompost.com. You know, we'd love to have you join us there. Um, and then I do a, a garden podcast called the Healthy Garden Podcast. Uh, it's not always weekly, you know, during, uh, it's been different because sometimes I'm on the farm for weeks and can't do a weekly podcast from the farm. Uh, and it's on Apple Podcasts and Podbean. Um, so love to have you guys join us there as well. Um, and we get a lot of people that ask us questions on our uh, Facebook and Instagram pages. And we, and we always answer. And that's it.
Well, thank you, Randy. That was a ton of information there. So I'm gonna just go ahead and uh, address some of the questions in the chat here, um, or I'll read the questions and you can answer them. Um, so the first one is, can you please address how we can get rid of the soil or get rid soil of the effects of Ilanthus? So Ilanthus is the tree of heaven, um, really should be named tree of hell, but I'm guessing they're asking um, how to restore that soil um, where that tree was grown. Mm, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that question before. Um, I would say there's a couple things I would try. Um, you could uh, you could start by flushing um, that soil with compost teas from a good compost. You could also flush that soil with a bacterial enzyme that's put out by a company called SLF. Uh, it's called SLF 100, and the company is I think called Cascade Organics. A lot of times when I get into areas where um, We've had uh, either toxins in the soil uh, or, you know, issues um, with, uh, you know, different things that, that were grown uh, on a site and we're changing that site. We'll go ahead and flush with the um, bacterial enzyme and then flush with the compost teas. I would start there. Okay. And the next question is, where do we find these nematodes as in the source to buy them from? Um, several places. You can go online and look um, uh, for different places that sell beneficial uh, insects. One of the places that we use and we recommend uh, is a place called Rincon Vitova, and that's R-I-N-C-O-N dash Vitova, V-I-T-O-V-A. They ship all over, uh, I think all over the United States, maybe into the the war around the world, um, but we um, on several of the properties and sites that we've worked on, we um, they ship them to us and we have them the next day. And, and we've got, uh, they also have a really good website. It's a really good resource um, to look at, you know, where you can see if you've got leaf damage that maybe you're thinking, you know, oh, it's water or it's a calcium deficiency or it's whatever, but you can go ahead and um, take a look at that. And they'll, you know, a lot of times it'll be, it'll be a, uh, an insect. Okay. So next question is, how long does compost last in the bag, unopened or partially unused open bag? Uh, as long as, uh, you know, if you can, if you can keep uh, compost in a bag uh, uh, relatively dry, like, you know, put it in a, in a shed or off to the side where, you know, outside, you know, a pole barn or whatever. Um, so it's not just getting soaked and then and then drying out and then getting soaked again and drying out. Um, it starts to lose its efficacy then, but if you, it will last. I've had compost that we've, cause we do this, we pull compost bags and we stash them, you know, different places. I've had stuff that, you know, been five, six years old that, you know, uh, is completely uh, full of life. Okay. So going back to the nematodes, um, this uh, person said that they always thought they had healthy soil because they amend with compost uh, and vermicompost. Uh, they do our diesel and horse manure. Um, and they found lots of grubs in their raised garden beds and they applied beneficial nematodes um, about a week and a half, a half ago and they still found some grubs now. And uh, they're wondering what attracted the grubs to their soil and how they can make it healthier uh, when they're amending it, when they've already amended it. Yeah, it's interesting. You get you get a lot of grubs in. Um, they probably do have really good soil. So the organic matter, the stuff that's in there, you know, it 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 takes um, the good guys and the bad guys. And so um, I just in when I was planting our orchard, I found you know quite a few grubs in the soil that was uh, up on our hillside, uh, and so. Um, again, I amended with nematodes. It, you know, you, if they're if they've only done it a week and a half ago, it's not enough time to address this. Um, but uh, in the long term, uh, one of the things too that I'm I'm doing is I introduce. Um, <laughs> not everybody can do this, but I'm introducing chickens into our um, uh, property because they love um, grubs are like one of their favorite things um, ever. So um, I'm, I, I'm doing that at our place, but um, it's something you're just going to battle. It's a constant. That's one of those things where that's it's nature. 
Um, but in a lot of ways, they're not affecting your food crop uh, in such a negative way that they're, they can't be in harmony. You know, you can't find a balance out there with introducing your nematodes um, as you're cutting, you know, as you're digging new stuff or as you're, you know, as you're getting into your soil and you're planting new things and you find grubs, take them out, throw them out, get rid of them, get them out of there, you know, throw them out to, um, you know, take, take them down the street to who has a chicken, you know, just get them, you know, I, I, I do that all the time. I took, I took uh, probably half of a five gallon bucket of grubs out of the holes I was digging the other day. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Same. I've had grubs in my garden 10 years ago and a couple of years consistently. And I just pick them out and lay them out and the birds will love them. So the chicken. chickens are, <laughs> chickens are even better. Oh yeah, no, they're, yeah. So <laughs> it's one of those things where, again, you remember I said back in the class, it takes time. It's going to take time. It's not something that, you know, this, the process and, and kudos to your, to your customer, you know, there who's doing that, because that's great. Just know, you're on the right path, just stay on the, stay the course. You know, that's something that happens a lot where people freak out, you know, and see something. And I'm not saying your guys are, but I'm saying people will go that example I gave of, Oh my God, I've got white fly or aphids. And then they just go crazy, you know, out there spraying stuff. And I'm like, yes, you spent all this time composting and doing all this, all the, all this stuff. And just cause you had some bugs, like you, you know, this, you, there was a much easier way that maybe wouldn't have been as instant, but pretty good in terms of nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the next question is, do you recommend a certain brand of worm castings? Uh, well, um, there's a casting that I um, like a lot. When we have worm, that's the thing too. If you can do it, we have worm bins at my house. So we have, I don't know, four or five worm bins and and you know so i recommend doing that composting and for anybody that can create a worm bin there's a company out of san diego uh called agrowin a-g-r-o-w-i-n and they have a really good casting um uh i've used their casting um and they also actually have a really good uh have a, ro a good rock dust too uh those guys and then uh Crater Lake Minerals has a great rock dust out of, out of Oregon, Southern Oregon. Okay. And the next question is, um, when you mentioned you top dress with amendments frequently, do you do it several times a week or once a week or something else? <laughs> um, for me, I'm doing it um, in my food garden when I'm really in heavy production, at least um, I'm, you know, doing it every other week. Um, just really lightly. I'll hit it, you know, just super light. So I'm not using a lot of material. I'm mostly what I'm doing is the microbes will do the heavy lifting in terms of, you know, you water them, you wet them, they'll dig into the soil. Um, they'll, they'll keep breaking down other organic matter that you have in your potting soil or in your soil mix or your bed mix, whatever you're doing. And then what I do is I come back in and, you know, pretty much every three to four weeks, I do want a drench of compost tea and that complements <clears throat> my composting or my top dressing. Um, because what I'm doing is I right at root level, I'm giving nutrient for uptake if the plant needs something. And you can tell right away after a compost tea, you know, a garden will literally just stay. You, you want something instant in, in organic gardening, doing a compost tea application generally makes your plants just stand up, you know, and get very happy. Yeah. Uh, next question is, can you use the mowed grass as part of compost? Sure, but just realize it's it's a um, it's it's a it's a hot nitrogen, so it's gonna you know so depending on how much you have, um, you know you, you need to have a balance um, in your carbon and nitrogen ratio. So just make sure. I've seen some pretty um, super hot piles of grass clippings. Um, so just you know make sure that you uh, are aware of that. That could it could get real hot. It could it could. I've seen, uh, <laughs> I've seen stuff get very hot to the point of catching things on fire. So just be careful. But yeah, you can use them for sure. And especially if you're, especially 
transition to organic lawn care, that's they're that's fantastic, you know. But you know, if you, um, but again, the microbes will break any of the toxins down from any of those, you know, lawn products. Okay, so the next question is, is uh, I think I'll address this. Can you link the RNA GMO article from Australia? And I think there are a couple other links that they had requested from your talk. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and email the, the links that you had mentioned um, with the email uh, that I'll be sending out later on. Okay. Uh, the next question is, do you use Epsom salts? No, I don't. I, I know a lot of people do in rose gardens and other you know areas of the garden, but no, I don't. Okay. Um, if I have chloramine in my city water, can I use it for compost tea? Uh, yeah, here's the great thing on that is, uh, is um, that humic acid will bind chloramine. So it won't make it inert, you know, um, but you can definitely use it. The um, uh, humic acid that's in compost will uh, in the compost tea will bind it and you'll be fine you know so I've run um, tests on um, on uh, compost tea that was made uh, in water with chloramine and with and with chlorine um, for that matter from different um, cities and you'll you'll lose uh, a small percentage of your biology you know like less than 20 percent but 80 percent of you know of trillions of microbes is a lot Next question is, how do we make compost tea? Uh, <clears throat> well, if you have a good, um, you can go to, you can go to Linkso and buy it. Um, when they're doing it. <laughs> Thanks, um, Randy. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. Just, you get a jug and boom, you're ready to go. Um, also, you, if you have a good finished compost, and, and when I mean finished, I mean that the compost doesn't smell, it's done. Uh, breaking down. And what I do with finished compost is like even in my backyard on my compost at home, I have a, um, a three by two um, uh, eighth inch screen um, that I made. And what I do is I take my compost and I screen it through there. I put it on top and I screen it through. You can, um, you can make, put compost tea in a, um, uh, you can create a compost tea sachet or bag um, if you wish um, uh, out of like a paint strainer bag um, or an organic cotton muslin little bag. You know, you, you need about a quarter pound or so of compost um, for every uh, five gallons of water. And, um, or you can go out, you can go, you know, Malibu compost sells compost tea in little tea bags that are like that. And we sell four to a, to a uh, sleeve and you can go onto our website and see what they do and how they work. And they're pretty easy. So that's a, those are a few different ways. Um, we also talk about that all the time on the healthy garden podcast, like how to make teas and stuff and do stuff. So there's episodes on that too. People want to go back and hear it. Yeah. On the same topic, do you dilute the compost tea or use them full strength? Uh, I use it full strength. Okay. And uh, why don't you aerate your compost tea? Uh, well, I do. I mean, I have, I have, uh, I have several brewers, you know, so we do, but what I find really easy for me, just especially working in the home garden is it's really easy just to make, you know, a bucket, a five gallon bucket or two five gallon buckets. You know, I, I let the water sit out overnight, throw the tea bag, uh, I mean, during the day, I throw the tea bag in, let it sit in overnight, squeeze it, stir it, and, and I either put it in my little Hudson's half gallon sprayer or I use my, uh, you know, watering can and, and depending if I'm doing a drench or a foliar application. And for me, that's really simple. And my cleanup is a bucket and my whatever I put it through. When I, when I use my brewers, I've got a, you know, I've got a lot more cleanup with it. And I, I find that unless I'm in an area where I really need um, a, a big microbial hit, um, I'm, I'm just finding that I'm using less, uh, you know, less uh, of the accurately aerated compost tea. I did when we moved to the new, our new place, um, I, I did do a lot of aerated compost teas as, as my initial drenches, but I could do the same thing with an extraction. I just had the equipment. 
Um, so not all potting soils are the same. Do you recommend any brands? <clears throat> <laughs> um, I, I do work for a company called Malibu Compost. <laughs> Um, and I do think that our potting soil, Baby Boo's potting soil, is phenomenal. So um, I've used it in a lot of different applications. So that's my favorite. Uh, you know, I, I've used other potting soils. You know, back in the day before we made a potting soil, I used to use uh, Ocean Forest from Fox Farm and add uh, a little bit more perlite to it and then add our compost to it. Okay. Um, next thing is, does Randy have a Facebook farm page or Insta I can follow? This is my sixth webinar this week and he surpassed all of them down to earth and real language. Appreciate this so much. So maybe for this one, if we can just go back and flash the, the, uh, the, the page that you had, Randy, with your um, Facebook page and the, I think the previous oh, yeah. slide there. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm, what is that? There we go, right there, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is just a comment. If you're familiar with biodynamics, Steiner and um, anthro anthroposophy, <laughs> then you'll yeah. appreciate the value of what you're doing. Just a comment there. Um, can we get the absolutely hundred percent? Thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. And we and and um, yeah. And and for me coming from, I didn't come from that background. Um, one of the other founders did and I, you know, but I learned, um, I learned prior to making compost in my landscaping world um, uh, from a couple of uh, incredible biodynamic teachers who taught me quite a bit. And I learned a lot about soil health and closing the loop on whether it's a farm a garden, whatever. Yes, I'm a hundred percent. I've had incredible teachers in terms of uh, my biodynamic learning curve. So this question's uh, sort of been answered in the chat, but I'll, I'll ask you anyway. What are heirloom seeds, and can the participants get the heirloom seed links? Sure. I mean, heirloom seeds are just heirloom varieties, you know, um, uh, so you're looking at, you know, older varieties of, of, of seeds and um, some of the, you know, a lot of them are tried and true and a lot of them are the ones that are the, are the ones that, uh, you know, we created, uh, you know, modified versions of those um, in modern growing, um, hybridized versions of those. Uh, I like, I try to go back to as many of the heirlooms um, as possible. And, and you can, you know, like, um, oh, uh, why am I drawing a blank? Um, the guys that did the Petal Petaluma. Um, Rare seeds? Uh, no, it was. Um, Baker Creek, perhaps. Thank you. thank you. Tons of heirloom seeds. Yeah, Same Baker thing. Creek. Baker Creek. Yeah, Baker Creek is one of them too. You know, and also like if you're looking for even heirloom varieties of let's say fruit trees, um, all the fruit trees that I just grew, a lot of them, I, I get a lot of my, um, uh, I get a lot of my stock from um, trees of antiquity. They've got oh. a lot of incredible heirloom variety, apples, uh, pears, you know, just amazing stuff. So if you, ha if you haven't been on the trees of antiquity website, cool spot. Okay, and what's a good source for clean organic starts? <laughs> well, grow them from uh, seed. <laughs> I mean, growing from seed is, is for sure like my preferred, you know, method. And um, I grow in, you know, a, a seed starter that we make. Um, but uh, there are several, as I said, there are, I would go if I'm gonna grow in a start from a nursery, I would definitely go with the organic starts over um, the non-organic starts. Um, and a lot of times you'll have different, um, I know a couple of my local nurseries carry starts from little small local farms. I tend to buy those and then I put them immediately into my healthy soil and then I start running my compost teas and I start running the protocols as I discussed earlier. Okay. Um, how do you compost leaves? 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, well, you add them into your compost bin uh, with your other, you know, depending on whether you got dry or, you know, whether they're dry or whether they're, they're, they're green. Uh, um, the other thing I do with leaves a lot is I, uh, I have a little um, uh, electric um, shredder and um, a little tiny plug-in shredder. And a lot of times I shred, uh, I'll shred some of my leaf litter to use as a mulch, which works really nicely. And then you just kind of can top dress that with compost. But if you have a lot of leaf litter, um, you know, uh, and it's dry leaf litter, you know, you're gonna need, um, you know, something uh, as, a, as a nitrogen um, to create some balance and start playing with your mixes in your yard. Like, you know, see what you have that's green, see what you have that's brown, and, you know, start off with a 50-50 mix and then start moving it from there, seeing what happens with it. What's your view on adding activated charcoal and bamboo vinegar? Mm, I don't, uh, I don't have a view. <laughs> <laughs> What about biochar? I'm going to throw that in there. I, I like using biochar. Um, uh, I think using biochar in soil mixes um, can be definitely a good thing for sure. Uh, I, I recommend it. We, uh, I do it. I do it occasionally in my, you know, in my uh, soil mixes, add a little bit of biochar to it. Yeah. Great. Um, where do we get our soil tested and how expensive is it? Uh, okay, well, most um, um, local ag concerns have uh, ways you can get stuff tested or you can go through your, um, you know, your state extensions from, you know, like your, like a local college state extensions have, um, have ways that you can get basic soil analysis and they run from, $25, mostly 35 up to, depending on how much, you know, detail you want to get, they can be um, even up to $75. And then you can also get, um, there's uh, places you can get biological uh, analysis as well, which were, which is a good thing to know too. So um, that'll give you what your microbial count is, and it will uh, tell you how much active biology you've got. Uh, and those are good. One thing I will tell you on the soil analysis, your basic soil testing, um, on the back page, they always give you recommendations. And because they're coming from a science standpoint, from a soil scientist standpoint, uh, if you're growing organically, uh, don't do what they recommend. Just, <laughs> just FYI, just don't, you know, it's on there, but don't do what they say. You do, do if you're growing organically, use compost. Use, uh, if you need to add mineral, add a good rock dust, you know, add the things that we were talking about earlier. To add on to that, Randy, how do you get compost tested? Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. You, you, can, you can send your compost in and, you know, and, uh, and they'll give you an analysis of what's up. We use, a, you know, a bigger lab because we're making a lot of compost, but, uh, you know, but, but, you know, the state extensions um, will give you, you know, have a decent, um, generally have a decent program for a ba good basic analysis. So can you use compost tea as a foliar applicant? If so, would it help uh, to reduce powdery white mildew? Yes, definitely. And again, it's not going to happen, you know, overnight, depending on how big your, how big the bloom is, how big your outbreak is. Um, you know, you may have to spray it, you know, three or four times, you know, before it really starts to go away. Um, and then start looking at like, why do you have um, powdery mildew? Like what's happening there? Is it, um, is it a water issue? Um, is it, uh, you know, is it just a moisture issue in your soil? It, are, are your plants, um, you know, too close together? Is it confined? Is there not enough wind movement, air movement? Uh, look at those kinds of things too. Those are, you know, that can help you um, solve uh, we've solved some pretty hard um, uh, powdery mildew issues and fungal issues by just fixing some of the um, natural remedy situation by remedying moving plants, opening stuff up, allowing wind, you know, allowing allowing some air movement, um, fixing irrigation that was, you know, that that soil was staying way too wet. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, next question is, if I have mulch on top of the compost, do I need to remove the mulch before adding new compost? Uh, it depends on what you've used as a compost. So if you have like, you know, uh, wood and it's thick, you know, yeah, you're going to want to go ahead and, and move that back. If you're using like, like shredded leaf, like I use a lot of times where you've got shredded straw or straw that's really broken down, um, you can go ahead and put the compost on top of that and kind of, you know, that'll help also break down that, uh, that mulch. Okay. Are eggshells good for composting? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so folks it's really not so good for grinding up in your little in your food processor and using them, you know, as a as a as a uh, as part of your top dress. Yeah. yeah. Um, folks that really want to know the two studies that you mentioned for depression and PTSD, and if there's a link, they'd like uh, that to be shared. And they want to know who's conducting the study on soil bacteria affecting the uh, depression reduction. And um, I'll give you. Uh, why don't I send you the links? Because I don't have them. I don't. I don't have the 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 cited stuff. I have it. It's on my computer in a file. Okay, so I'll follow up with you on that, and we'll email them out with the resources. Yeah. And, and, and there are multiple studies, which is great. But yeah, I'll I'll give you the two that I've been looking at. Okay. Um, someone asked, can we purchase some of your crops? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, uh, you know, the, the crop, the crop you can purchase is, um, and link so sells us is our, is our booze blend compost and our baby booze potting soil. Um, the compost on our farms is a, we look at it as a crop. It's something that takes, uh, five to six months to finish and it's on soil and it's, you know, it's, it's treated uh, with a lot of touches. So that's something that you could buy that we make, uh, not the stuff that I grow and the other farms that I, we work with, um, those are, uh, the, their, their stuff goes elsewhere. Uh, um, so some of the vineyards carry us, uh, carry our, you know, use our stuff. You could buy some vino. Uh, but I would say, you know, buy, buy the compost and add that to your soil and add that to your mixes. That would, that would, even though I make the compost and I was on the farm, you know, today, uh, and I'm going back to the farm tonight when we're off of here, um, it, it, it always blows my mind. You know, when I get out there and I see all these windrows and I put my hand in the compost and I feel it and I, um, and then I see what it does in my own garden. You know, I'm just, I'm a gardening geek too, you know, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty stoked when I, when I bring stuff in from, you know, uh, from the backyard and, uh, and, and we eat it at home. So. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, would you please repeat the list of meals of fertilizers, um, that you won't use? Uh, they said bone meal, feather meal, cotton seed meal, I'm guessing blood meal is the other one that you had said. Yes, correct. And those are all animals that are fed GMO feedstocks. Um, so, you know, like when you look at, uh, you know, a, a CAFO environment, um, uh, those are, you know, animals that are literally fed uh, conventional ag animals that are fed GMO feedstocks. Uh, and so I don't use, you know, I don't use any of those meals, you know, um, so you got to be careful. And, you um, you know, and because because um, they've all been sprayed, just remember, you know, um, that's one of the things I loved about the piece that I looked at um, from Australia. They actually, in their notes, talk about that, that they actually, you know, uh, acknowledge that we are getting, um, uh, you know, glyphosate particulates on our on our on our food. Yeah. So the next question is, can we put fresh chicken manure in the garden, like an orchard or a veggie garden? Better compost it. Um, it, it will be really hot. So um, great that you have chickens. That's awesome. And But I would, uh, no, separate that out and let it, let it compost and cool down for sure. Okay. 
So um, on the Ma Malibu's website, the compost D for lawns, um, you know, the direction says one bag makes 20 gallons. And then the instruction says two gallon covers about 2,000 square feet. Um, so this person has a small yard um, around 2,000 square feet or so. Um, would they then use one tenth of the bag per application? So I guess it's a ratio question. Yeah, what I would do with that is I literally just go ahead and um, do a like put uh, um, two gallons to three gallons of water in a bucket, put the bag in there, and then use a hose end sprayer to um, let it soak overnight, squeeze the bag out, um, and it's you know it's fine. It's very concentrated, and they can go ahead and. Um, uh, you know, just use that as their uh, as their fertilizer, and then you put it through a hose end sprayer at a mid level setting, and you're and you're good to go. If they wanted to, they could get you know they could uh, get another they could cut the bag in half. I'm I guess for that small of a, a space. Um, and um, well, actually, no, that's actually right. You can make up to twenty gallons of tea, but you know, it, it two thousand square feet is about right. What it's going to do anyway. Um, so they're fine. Just get, they can do that, use that, and they'll be good to go. But use a hose end sprayer and you'll be fine. And what's the form of calcium uh, you're recommended to take as supplement? I'm not sure. I think calcium supplement question here. I don't, I'm not yeah, sure. Here, hang on, I'll tell you. <laughs> Okay, so if you can see it, this is what my, uh, let's see. Cow mag. Cow mag complete, complete <laughs> uh, by Welltrians. That's what my, that's what my naturopath gives me. Okay. Um, I think we can end on this note. Someone's asking if you're uh, interested in being a mentor and they would totally relocate. <laughs> um, uh, wow. Um, I'm at a spot right now where uh, really between the two farms, it's tough for me to do that uh, and also help run the company. So I you know, I'm happy to, uh, you know, help people as I can help them. But right now I've got, I'm, I'm mentoring people that are working on the farm and we aren't hiring anybody else right now. We, we actually added some crew during the uh, COVID-19. They could always send me a, um, an email and a, and a resume or whatever and just say, hey, I'm, you know, I mean, because if something opens up, that's how, in fact, one of the guys I was telling Ken before the, the class, the, one of the guys who was at the class we did in December reached out to me afterwards and said, are you guys hiring? I really would love to work for you. And we just had an opening that week and, you know, and he's working with us and he's been working with us, you know, since I think March or April. So Fantastic. It happens. Yeah. yeah. And that's, a, that's, Randy's a great resource. So if you just reach out to him via email, it's super responsive. And um, I, I do encourage you folks to do that. And within the email that I'll be sending out later today, I'll include uh, Randy's information as well um, and the recorded link. Um, and Randy, do you have any closing remarks before we sign off here? Yeah, I would just say, you know, thanks for having, um, you know, having me do this again, uh, Ken, and, and thank you to Linkso for uh, supporting Malibu Compost. Uh, you know, you guys have supported us for a long time, and uh, that means a lot to us. <clears throat> and I would just say, hey, guys, just, just, you know, your health is what you got. And, you know, this is really important. And, um, and I really kudos to everybody for coming on today and thinking about this, because, um, in my life, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, my belief, you know, I, I believe in God, my, and I got my family, and I've got the farming, and that's what I believe in. And uh, that's what keeps me going. And I've got to be healthy to, you know, be spiritually fit, mentally fit, and emotionally fit. So 
uh, and and my gut has to be functioning at a high level to do all those things. So um, I hope everybody got something out of this and please reach out if you have questions, follow us on Facebook, check out Malibu Compost, check out the blogs and, and tune into the Healthy Garden Podcast. It's, it's a different gardening show. Okay. Thank you very much, Randy. Thanks again, everybody for attending and take care. <laughs>